Now it is my great pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Dr. Harvey Fine, president of the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation. Dr. Feinberg has devoted most of his academic career and research to the fields of health policy, medical decision-making, and infectious diseases. With both his MD public policy from Harvard University, he served as a visiting professor of medicine at UCSF, as provost of Harvard University, and as dean of the Harvard School of Public Health. He was the president of the National Academy of Medicine, the board of the New England Journal of Medicine. He was a founder and president of the Society for Medical Decision Making, and he's been a consultant to the World Health Organization. In response to the COVID-19 outbreak, the White House Office of Technology Policy has asked the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine for a standing committee on emerging infectious diseases and 21st century health threats to help integrate science into our national preparedness to identify the best practices for responses in this crisis. Dr. Feinberg serves as chair of this new standing committee and he recently published an article in the New England Journal of Medicine entitled, 10 Weeks to Crush the Curve. Again, please welcome me in joining Dr. Feinberg. Thank you so much, Dr. Duffy. It's a pleasure to be with you, and I look forward to the conversation. Thank you. So now some of my questions to get us started, and then we'll move to audience. How did we get here? From a medical standpoint, what were the factors making this threat? so much worse than swine flu, H1N1 flu, the other diseases with which we've had experience in recent years? The first thing to recognize is that this coronavirus outbreak stands in the sequence of emerging infectious disease threats over a long period of time. HIV was actually a virus that came from primates into the human population. That one, of course, was spread by sexual contact. But we've had many other viruses since then that have also emerged. We had Zika. We've had Ebola. We had SARS that came in the beginning of the 21st century. We had MERS, which is another coronavirus. We also had the reemergence of pandemic influenza uh, in 2009, an H1N1 type of influenza. And so in all of these instances, we've had repeated notice that emerging infection is something that we can anticipate. So this outbreak is not in principle a surprise, but it does have certain characteristics that make it and a very serious problem. One of these is the fact that illness, when it occurs, especially as you get in older age groups becomes more severe and more likely to cause deterioration and death. So it's a serious problem if you get infected. A second reality is this is a respiratory virus that is capable easily of spreading from one person to another, either from droplets that emanate from the respiratory tract or by touching a surface that's been contaminated and then bringing our hand to our face and the virus gets into a mucous membrane that way. Easily transmitted. Third feature of this virus is that a very substantial risk of transmission can occur before anyone who's infected is symptomatic. So if you're ill, but you've been infected, and for a couple of days before you start to get your symptoms, you can infect others very efficiently because the virus tends to build up to a maximum set of symptoms and then to diminish over time. So you've got easy transmission, relative severity, and transmission when it's invisible. So these are the ingredients for a more serious serious threat. And that's what we've been facing. Thank you. Even stepping back a little further, there's been a little bit of discussion about sort of overall factors that may have inclined an infectious disease of this kind to 
time and to be as virulent. So some of the factors, mobility of populations, aging of populations relating to the severity that you noted, uh, animal to human contact, um, climate change. What are the background factors that have facilitated this disease uh, emerging and becoming as virulent? Since we recognize that many of these emerging infections are zoonotic, meaning that they came from an animal species human population, we, we can understand from that factors that could increase the likelihood of spread. One of them actually is the radical increase in animal protein consumption, which means we've got many, many more animals in close proximity. This is especially important, for example, with influenza that can infect bird populations like chickens and ducks, as well as hogs and, uh, and pig populations. All basically animals that we grow for food supply. But we've also moved our residences closer to nature. We have encroached on places where human habitation now occurs in proximity to animals. So, for example, uh, the uh, increasing uh, a problem of Lyme disease in the United States, which is a tick-borne disease from deer populations and mice, exacerbated by the rural living of more people or semi-rural living in proximity uh, to these animal populations. We also have a situation, for example, in Asia and China especially, on wet markets, as they are called, for food consumption. These are the places where fresh meat is available because the animals of all different species, including wild animals, are living at the time, then they're slaughtered on the spot, hence a wet market, and the purchaser takes them home. It may seem strange to us in the United States, but it's a very common way of living every day in Asia. When you compound with the types of change from climate disruption, with the advent of increasing travel that has made it easy for any infection to spread from one part of the globe any within the incubation period of the infection. You get infected, you get on an airplane, you get off on the other side of the planet, you feel fine, but you have carried that infection with you. So all of these factors together explain why we're seeing repeated episodes of disease emergence. So essentially, in a way, this is a disease of prosperity in the sense that meat consumption is associated with greater prosperity, greater nutrition, the sense of more protein. Standing back, obviously, we're looking for treatments, we're looking for vaccines, we're looking for better pandemic preparedness. But overall, in terms of these very broad factors, in terms of public health, things we should be looking at doing to mitigate the dangers of these diseases. Number one, we have to be vigilant about the emergence of infection. We have to take steps to reduce that are reducible. For example, in spacing people and limiting the number of wet markets. Uh, after other outbreaks, it has proved possible, even in countries that depend on these markets, to close them for a period of time, sanitize the area, and to reduce the risk of re-emergent uh, disease from those very same places. We can also be more thoughtful about the ways in which we locate our housing. For us in California and in the important for wildfire prevention in the same way that it also helps protect us from exposure to animal-born uh, infection. So uh, that's the first part of primary prevention. Feature is rebuilding the infrastructure for public health that we have allowed to deteriorate over a period of time by underfunding our local departments of health, our state departments of health, and our Centers for Disease Control and Prevention in the United States. And we might add the importance of maintaining capacity globally through the World Health Organization. 
You mentioned, Dr. Duffy, that some of these may be disease, but they disproportionately have an impact on the poorer and less advantaged populations in the world and also even within our own country, within the United States. So preparedness on the part of health infrastructure, that's the second key ingredient. Third, we really have to learn the lesson of the importance of a national stockpile that can give substance to our national strategies for it is really inexcusable for us not to be in a position to mobilize and move the personal protective equipment that our clinicians and health workers, everyone in the health facility requires to get the kinds of treatment and diagnostic testing, as well as the ventilators that sustain life in place where they are needed. This is a lesson that places like Singapore, Hong Kong, and Taiwan learned from the SARS outbreak. It's now our turn to learn this lesson from the SARS-CoV-2 outbreak we're experiencing now. So that's the third leg of preparation. Be able to respond effectively and rapidly when an outbreak does occur. Going back for a moment to the global public health issues and our and our own here, um, the, in our country, I'm assuming the FDA the sale of meat and the availability of wet markets and so on. In other countries, is there a regulatory uh, structure, and how would the, do do there need to be a proliferation of FDA? more stringent regulatory entities around the world? What's the role of the World Health Organization? How does the danger from the wet markets uh, get regulated? There's a great deal of variation around with the ability to regulate uh, everything from drugs to tests. You can walk into any drugstore in many parts of the world and buy any antimicrobial that you want without a prescription. Uh, that's really not very, so a very uh, dangerous uh, way to promote antimicrobial resistance, the excessive and inappropriate use of antimicrobials in humans and, by the way, in animal populations as well. So regulatory structure is a problem in many parts of the world, uh, and the coordination across the relevant agencies is another very important element. The World Health Organization does have a valuable role to in setting standards and establishing norms, creating the systems for collaboration, and also putting in place agreements so that those parts of the world that sometimes are the source of the infection, they have to provide the virus genome so that others can begin to develop vaccines, et cetera that they are also going to be receiving vaccine when that vaccine is produced. So we're as a key player and the regulatory bodies to be both built up and brought into synchrony. Those are all very important parts of improving the global preparedness for these kinds of threats. And turning back to the U.S., uh, you mentioned lack of funding for the CDC, local public health entities. How would that improve? Who would make that happen? Who lobbies for better public health entity funding? Or the how will we see this improve? You know, Dr. Duffy, in the United States, in the way our system works, we're pretty good at avoiding targeted harm because that sector, industry, or pop will lobby like the Dickens. We're not as good at protecting all of us when we need to because no one of us or subgroup is especially hard affected by the deficiency. This is something that has to have a Congress and an executive step forward and recognize the need and to put forward the legislation and the funding that will provide the public support that protects us. We can't look at it any other way except like we look at insurance. 
We don't write to our insurance company at the end of the year complaining that we paid for the fire insurance and we didn't have a fire this year. So any of us, please send the money back. We are willing to pay for insurance when it makes sense. And if there's one lesson from the coronavirus this year, that insurance makes a lot of sense. Well, let's leadership from members of Congress and others who would step out on this and uh, start uh, lobbying and, and formulating legislation to improve the funding of our public health entities. Let's turn for a moment to the question and again, tapping your expertise as a physician and a, and a very prominent one, we hear uh, different trials and different successes. Uh, a week ago, Pluristem seemed to be uh, uh, had to have some curative capability on a trial in Israel. Now, uh, 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 Remdesivir from Gilead is getting more attention today and it was a few weeks ago. How are these, what do you see in terms of potential treatments? Uh, and let just give us a medical sense of what's going on in terms of finding treatment. Well, what I can say from the vantage point of the uh, of the of the scene is that it's a great thing that we've got multiple studies underway from many different vantage points of treatment. We've got uh, studies with the plasma of recovered patients, bodies that might be helpful to those who are trying to fight off the infection. We've got a number of antivirals, such as the ones you described, which were developed uh, originally to fight other viruses, either HIV or uh, Ebola. We're testing, could they have a beneficial effect against uh, the coronavirus? We've got other strategies that work at parts of the immune system or to the exuberant response that may not be able to us, a so-called cytokine storm, whether we could maybe suppress that in some patients where that becomes the problem for their deterioration. So right now we've got a lot of these studies underway acutely, and we're all eager for the results of the controlled studies that will give us evidence. You know, in medicine, we often say the plural of anecdote is not evidence. And so stories of a patient who got better when they were treated with whatever it is, isn't sufficient to really be good evidence, especially when Virtually any drug you can think of does have side effects, risks attached, and you really want to know that the benefits outweigh those risks. The good thing is that now we can acutely test many different treatments because we're dealing with the number of patients at the same time. So that's a huge burden but it's the opportunity to get rapid information as soon as the studies can be done that will inform all of us about the ways to more treat patients over time. So let's talk about um, your steps to crush the curve or the 10 weeks to crush the curve. The national dialogue has been more about bending the curve. You're using the word crush. What's the distinction? You know, that was uh, weeks ago, which seems like lifetimes ago in the coronavirus uh, outbreak. When I described a strategy to crush the curve, meaning slow things down, but really eliminate uh, the threat of this virus, not every last case, but get it down. I was talking about the opportunity, which is in, in fact still present, put in place a concerted, systematic approach nationally that would not simply slow this down, but would radically truncate the spread. Right now, we're celebrating the fact that the slowing of the number of new cases, the number of deaths where the epidemic is most advanced. And time will tell, but we're most likely to see a gradual slackening off rather than the drop. 
And that's because with all the steps we're taking, there's still transmission. Uh, we've all heard from you know famous people who have uh, talked about their uh, infections, people like uh, Chris Cuomo, who's been uh, broadcasting even while infected so courageously and in such an informed way. And now he reveals that his wife has become positive at home. And uh, George Stephanopoulos, another public figure who talked about acquiring the infection from his spouse. So this tells us something in as an illustration of a really important problem. When we take care of patient, patients at home, we are putting in jeopardy of the family. Sometimes those second cases will be mild, but if they happen to be a parent or an elder person in the family, that's especially worrisome. So part of the strategy to crush the curve is more aggressively isolating cases so that we interrupt the spread of this virus at the early stage when it's still possible to limit the number of new cases. But of crushing the curve, the very first point was to establish a unified command structure for the nation, for each state, uh, putting in charge a person who has the full authority of the chief executive, the president or the governor, and is able to serve as the leader and the quarterback of the team who are working to this curve, to stop this pandemic. That's been, uh, a, in a way, I think a defect for many of our jurisdictions uh, where we haven't treated what we've recognized as a war against the virus, but with the same effective strategy that we would bring together in fighting a war. And I would say the greatest single deficiency that we have had is our limited intelligence because of insufficient testing. That was a part of the strategy that I outlined several weeks ago to crush the curve, and it's still a critical part of the strategy today. You don't limit every person in the population. But we need testing for two different purposes. We need to identify patients, and we need to understand spread in the community. We also need to be able to identify individuals who have previously been infected and now may be immune. These are different kinds of tests that we'll rely upon. Some of them are the so-called PCR tests that examine our units in the virus and detect their presence. Others are antibody tests, which are coming online that determine whether an individual has responded to a previous viral infection. We need both types. Second type are especially important for stratified, random, repeated sampling in the community where from a few hundred to a few thousand tests, we can estimate with very high precision what the rate of infection currently is in critical component populations, those in the general population, those in nursing homes, those in other congregate facilities that are at special risk, those at different age groups. And we can use that surveillance to help guide the focal attention for prevention. So testing remains our greatest single need to be able to get on top of this. And where are we on that? And what are the barriers uh, to the widespread testing you describe? We're getting better. We do have uh, more tests coming online in the, that is the the, uh, RNA test for the virus. One of the exciting positive things from my vantage point has been the way that many of our university laboratories and research centers, they've converted their equipment from genomic research to being able to apply those for evaluation in a diagnostic way 
of uh, patient samples. One of the is what you could call standard operating procedure in our hospitals and clinics that have well-established mechanisms for working with the commercial vendors and other test labs that have been long also for billing procedures and practices. They know how to work that system. And they don't have good total systems in place to work with the local laboratories from the university. So something as simple, seemingly obvious to establish the collection, transportation, billing, and follow-up for the patient record so that everything is as seamless for the clinic with those university labs as it would be if they went to a commercial lab. That's been a part of the reason it's taking time to get those in place. It's a little different story on the antibody testing. Uh, antibody testing is being proposed by dozens of different uh, companies. There are a number that have been approved and are online. We've got another level of complexity and difficulty with our antibody tests. The FDA, which in normal conditions, very stringent pre-market evaluation requirements for any new diagnosis, had put in place what were called emergency use authorization conditions. This would to bring to market the diagnostic tests for antibodies without going through as elaborate pre-market testing. And frankly, the FDA has even relaxed those standards a little bit more. The result is that today, one of our greatest needs is for independent post-market validation of the performance of many of these available antibody tests so that we how well they work one as compared to the other. The recent experience in the United Kingdom, where they literally had to withdraw millions of these antibody tests. And the reason was that the tests that detected the antibody to the SARS-CoV-2 coronavirus was cross-reacting with the common cold coronavirus antibodies to which virtually all of us have. So that made those tests uh, effectively useless. And that's the kind of quality assurance that we have to have in order to make full and effective antibody tests. So in short, they're getting more available. We're learning to use them a little more effectively. We need to keep in mind the purpose for the testing in order to use them wisely. Quality assurance is going to be critically important. So this relates back to your first step, uh, which is unified command. Uh, it's interesting. Uh, technically, I guess the vice is in charge of response. Um, it's, there have been different uh, unified commands for other crises like this. I spoke with Janet Napolitano yesterday. She pointed out that as Secretary of Homeland Security in 2009, she was the point person for the response to the H1N1 virus. Who should be the, should there be a separate in, independent coordinator, perhaps with medical science, public health? as this unified command person who could take charge and uh, drive the testing, make sure it's done to medically appropriate standards. What do you envision for this unified command? The vice president is playing in coordinating the discussions across the, the response team uh, and in uh, apparently establishing good relations with governors all across the country and maintaining communication. Those are important functions. What I'm talking about, though, is not a coordinator across agency. It is a commander who is instilled with the authority and responsibility to execute. This is a person who would have leaders responsible for the development of the vaccine, for the development of effective treatment, for assuring that every health facility 
had the personal protective equipment that they needed for carrying out the responsibility of all these been having on diagnostic tests throughout the country. We have heard at different times from superior leaders like Dr. Tony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Burks, who are doing their part to obtain excellent science and public health perspective and to communicate with the public. But an overall director, a guide, a chief would be assigning each of these people the critical resources to carry out at the national level, like Dr. Napolitano was describing, and also have counterparts at every state, and frankly, at every county around the country. That's the sort of that we would expect in a military operation anywhere in the world. We would expect a central command we would expect a unified command structure down the line. We would expect flexibility and communication on the relevant units. We would expect execution individually with the freedom to judge on the ground and make adjustments, all the while reporting up and carrying out orders down. That's what's... Now, who could do that? First you have to have the complete confidence of the president. Uh, if you don't have the confidence of the president, this doesn't work if you're the national leader. Secondly, you've got to the government. This is not the time for bringing in someone who's for the first time going to be learning about what Homeland Security does as compared to Health and Human Services and what does FDA stand for anyway. No, you who's already got that experience. Third, ideally you'd need someone from the national level who was very savvy and able to work down the chain through the states, have good relations with the states. So what kind of be? Uh, just to illustrate, uh, you know, someone like a former secretary of HHS, like Mike Levitt, who was a governor, uh, uh, you could uh, look to them, Kathleen Sebelius, who was a governor. Each, uh, across the aisle, what about someone like Ash Carter, who was Secretary of Defense and who was truly deeply knowledgeable about all of the logistics uh, and requirements for supply throughout Defense Command? These are the type of individuals with the stature, the decisiveness, the judgment, the ability and know-how to have carried out and still could execute on crush. So um, let's turn to uh, getting the economy going again, because you've written another really great article, uh, this time on uh, the steps to be able to relaunch our economy back to work. Uh, five steps to reopen the economy, five principles, Etc. Can you tell us a little bit about those? I'm happy to. The, the first critical point to me, let's stop talking about dates and let's start talking about the conditions that have to be in place in order to safely and durably reopen the economy. So that's kind of principle number one. Number two, this pandemic is not uniform around the United States. It's at different stages. And fortunately, some states and certainly many locales have not yet experienced the brunt of this pandemic and with never get to that point. So we need a strategy that recognizes that different places will be ready at different times to go forward. Third, because of the interconnectedness of our metropolitan and our interstate relations, we need to adopt strategies that recognize regional identities. That's why it's so important as a number of governors in the Northeast, in the Midwest, in the Far West, are talking to each other about coordinating their plan, because that really is a valuable principle to keep in mind. Fourth, conditions will change. We will get new scientific knowledge. We'll learn more about who already has maybe new treatments. 
with luck, uh, a new vaccine that will actually work. All of these conditions on the ground will lead us to make other kinds of decisions because they alter reality. And the last principle was we've got to be prepared to ratchet up and ratchet down because things could go wrong. So now, what are the conditions? The first condition is we have where we stand vis-a-vis the virus. We were just talking about this a little earlier. We've got to do the surveillance in the community and the relevant populations continuing to detect the new cases. Yes, we want to measure hospitalization, disease and deaths, but those are the end of the line. We need to be at the front end early detection of any increase and change in uh, the state of this infection. So that's number one. Number two, we have to have the capacity to contain and to treat if and as we get a recurrence, an escalation, which many of the modelers are going to be likely if we relax our separation uh, further. So having that capacity to contain is the public health infrastructure we've been talking about. The treatment capacity, again, gets back to our hospital facilities, the ventilators, the protective equipment. And by the way, being able to safely care for all the patients who are not treated for COVID-19 infection and making sure workers are both safe themselves and are not unwittingly carrying this virus to other uninfected, debilitated patients. So very important uh, at that level. Third, we have to add the number down to the level where any escalation is still manageable. And that doesn't mean that it's just leveled off. It means that we've actually got it down level that we can act to contain given our ability to detect a recurrence or recrudescence. Now, these are all things about the health sector and the public health system. But in parallel, the fourth element is every business, every enterprise, every school can begin now to do. And that is we have to put in place new procedures, new ways of conducting our business, new ways of teaching, meeting, new ways of conducting dialogues with the Commonwealth Club that add to safety and protection over time. Does it make sense for us to reposition so people at work are further apart from one another? What about visitors and guests? Do we need to, to have the large meetings that we used to have in person? Should we be checking temperatures of employees uh, and visitors? All of these and many, many more are particular to each sector. It's different if you're a restaurant than if you're a factory, than if you're a university or if you're a grade school. And for each sector, we can put in the kind of steps that will change our physical environment to make it safer, put in place procedures and put in place practices and behaviors that can help us avoid the worst pandemic recurs. So I'd love to see best practices established by industry to enable all of us to test whether we are really ready for the new reality in the time of And finally, it would be great if we could make smart choices about what to restart, when, and how, based on all those previous four elements, weighing the risk and the benefit. We know what contributes to risk. We know it's about proximity, one person to another. It's about scale, the number of people who are in proximity. It's about duration. Are you in proximity? It's about activity and behavior. Are you just sitting quietly and eating or are you cheering, shouting, or singing 
in the same small space. And it is about that physical environment. If we're in the great outdoors, than if we're in a small enclosed office space. So those are the risk factors. We need to weigh those against the benefits economically and socially for our now very stringent separations so that we can get the economy moving again in a smart way. Certainly, schools should be reopened for many reasons because benefits not just to our students, but to liberating so many parents to also get back uh, to their jobs and work. And by the way, that's a great opportunity for the kind of learning that I emphasized in the crushing the curve piece, where you could learn very quickly how much infection is being spread among school children, because that isn't so much a threat just to these children. Fortunately, younger age groups are relatively unaffected clinically, but it would tell us a lot about the risk to teachers and other senior workers at the schools and about risk to parents and grandparents. At so that's something we could do. And maybe for a while, those large crowd musical exhibition sporting events that we all love to attend, maybe not now in the time of coronavirus to jump right back into those. Let's see how well we can do for a time by making smart moves and gradually open up other sectors of the economy. You know, you mentioned the need to rethink the design of how we work together and so on. So, uh, a couple years ago, the Commonwealth Club opened its new building, and on the advice of our architects, all of most of our staff are in large space, which has been the 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 recommendation and and the the trend in the architecture field for internal business uh, design, workplace design. But now I'm very impressed that the firm who designed our space, which is Gensler Architects. Has been. I've gotten two memos from them in the last couple of weeks about rethinking this and what a workspace is going to look like in an era of ongoing possible social distancing. So it looks like the architect is going through a lot of ferment and thinking through and trying to advise uh, employers and workplaces on how to move forward with this. So I'm happy to see some of this already going on. And Dr. Duffy, your point is so important illustrates the role that many, many different sectors have in helping us to get through this. This is not a problem just for the doctors or the politicians. This is a problem that every one of us has a purchase on and we can make a con. This is a huge opportunity for the design and architecture and construction firms to rethink elements. It's a time for our industrial hygiene and our occupational safety folks and experts to step forward expertise. So we're all in this together. And if we take advantage of everyone's contribution, we can get out of it as safely and as quickly as possible. There were a number of questions from our audience about what like with ongoing public health precautions and so on. I think you've answered most of those. I think we can get a picture now. Anything else to say about what ongoing public health precautions we may see in the days and years past the crisis? You know, so many of these are cultural things we kind of take for granted. The Chinese look at us without wearing face masks and they're baffled. Why isn't everyone who has a sniffle wearing a face mask? They do have courtesy uh, and respect for one another. So it's already deeply embedded in their culture. We look at their wet markets and we, we're baffled. Why don't they just stop those wet markets? Uh, because uh, from our point of view, uh, that's not the way we're accustomed to I think we're going to be rethinking on all sides many of the cultural norms and standards that are so ingrained that we don't even think about them. Things like shaking hands. Uh, you know, um, we need to rethink that as a norm of gracious greeting, 
There are other ways that we could extend our hearts and our minds without literally extending our hands to those whom we greet. So that's just a tiny illustration of some things that may be more long lasting. You know, travel has never been the same since uh, 9-11. And I expect that the aftermath of the time of coronavirus is going to with some lingering alterations in the way we live and interact with one another. So personally, you know, I've spent some time in Japan and when in Japan, one always adopts the prevailing method of greeting. And I'm thinking that this may be the way we should go. The idea of shaking hands because you want to show that you don't have a weapon in your hand, which sort of dates from medieval times, doesn't seem to really resonate anyway. Uh, today, So perhaps the uh, Eastern uh, custom of bowing is going to be in our future. Maybe. So let's talk for a moment about the OSTP requested standing committee at the National uh, a neutral forum to convene experts who can engage rapidly with the federal government, including responding on short notice to requests. You are the chair of this new committee. Why was it established? What is it going to do? Well, the National Academy of Engineering and Medicine are the main fora that represent the leading scientists, uh, health professionals, and engineers uh, in the United States. Uh, and that uh, organization has a way of advising the government on matters of science and technology. In fact, it was established by the Congress in 1863 during the Civil War for the express purpose of bringing the best of science to aid the cause uh, of that war, and it's had a very long and storied history since. What isn't as familiar for the academies is a kind of rapid turnaround of advice uh, in real time needed in a matter of hours or days as compared to months to a year or more to reflect on a really deep and hard problem. So in setting up this standing committee, we also recognized that we were going to need to operate different way to what had been customary. So we got a group of experts willing to put the time in when and how required. We had a group of staff who were willing to work day and night. We had reviewers who were ready to help improve the quality and the communicability of the work that we did. And in the space of less than 30 days, we literally responded to 11 specific scientific from the Office of Science and Technology Policy, the Department of Health and Human Services. And we also provided them with a list of issues that we thought were relevant and important in the near, medium, and long term. And in addition to that, convened one of what we call telephonic expert consultation, which can be brought together really in the matter of an hour or hours where we get a group of knowledgeable people on the phone to respond to a very uh, type of question. And uh, that service to the nation is something the National Academies are really distinctly equipped to provide. And I felt very honored to be asked to chair the committee. I uh, have felt very gratified by the incredible work of our members and especially the staff who've put forward so much to make it possible to help our, our uh, leaders uh, be better about the science. Wonderful. And so great to have a scientific rapid response capability like that. You had the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation established by the wonderful Gordon Moore and Betty Moore, uh, technology field, she of nursing. And uh, can you tell us a little bit about what the Moore Foundation is bringing to the table here, what you're thinking, what you're already doing, what you're thinking of doing? Well, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation uh, was by our founders, Gordon and Betty Moore, to solve problems in the world that were important and that would create lasting solutions. Uh, we have focused our work on basic science, on environmental 
on improving patient care, including the important programs in nursing uh, that you described, Dr. Duffy, and in supporting certain critical needs in the Bay Area, particularly our museum local conservation. In facing up to the coronavirus uh, pandemic, we've tried both to be responsive and help navigate through this pandemic without losing sight of the longer term improvements that we're trying to achieve. So we've worked with our grantees to relax conditions and work with them about ways they could continue to carry out their work with our and others' support. We've been happy that in our patient care space, especially our Diagnostic Excellence Initiative, we've been able to undertake a number of specific projects that relate directly to the interests of the foundation and contribute to our nation's ability, to the world's ability, really, to improve on diagnostic and prognostic tools for the COVID-19 pandemic. We've joined with our sister foundations through the Science Philanthropy made up of a number of our uh, sister foundations uh, around the country and indeed uh, in other parts of the world, as well as with bilateral uh, working together with important organizations like Schmidt Futures, Zuckerberg Initiative locally here in, uh, in the Bay Area, in order to create the conditions that we can work together to solve problems that may not be as easy or uh, evident to uh, any one of us. And finally, we do have a small directed community service program in which we support uh, local uh, institutions in, uh, in our Bay Area counties, directing the support especially to those who are serving those who are especially affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. So we're taking a number of steps uh, as a foundation uh, through our own programs, partnership uh, with others to do what we can with the resources we have, with the mission that we cherish to really make a positive difference against the COVID-19 threat. You have been practicing medicine and in, uh involved in and leading in the public health field for many decades, I think coming up on 50 years or so. Uh, did you ever expect that you would see a situation like we have essentially economically closed down with the virus running rampant, uh, the number of deaths and illnesses? Well, going back to our first discussion today, the fact of emergency uh, the reality of the experience over time tells us it can happen. It does happen. It doesn't tell us exactly when or exactly what. But there have been many uh, studies, including some that I have been personally involved in, that have talked about the need for preparedness, the expectation that we could face a pandemic of this scale and proportion. Uh, so in that sense, we were totally surprised, but when the reality hits you, you cannot help but gasp at the immensity of the impact on every dimension of life, not just on our health and well-being, livelihoods, our way of living, our relations to family and friends. And this has really been a profound, life-changing experience. So among your steps to crush the curve, there's one we didn't talk about all that much, and that's inspire and mobilize the public. What would you say? A lot of people watching this and uh, who are, uh, are, are unemployed, they're suffering, they're sheltering, they're uh, listening to all of this news, they're uh, anxious about their future, about the country's future. They're wondering when they can go back to work. Employers are wondering when they can safely bring back employees. What words of wisdom and comfort do you have for the general public out there who's experiencing this crisis at a very deep personal level? This is causing a lot of hurt. Uh, it's affecting us 
personally, with our families, with our and there's a two front war going on. There's a war against the virus, and there's a war to maintain the economy. Uh, I believe that the Congress has stepped forward. The Federal Reserve has have taken some important steps to protect each of us and our families for the near term. I believe we're going to have to do more on the economic front uh, to provide the security and the stability to us get through this really, really critical and dramatic situation. On the virus front, we need to hear from our leaders honest assessments, where exactly we stand, what exactly we plan. We need to hear it in calm, confident, clear terms. We've gotten that from some of our leaders and we have not received it from all of our leaders. We need more to be able to communicate in this way to reassure us that we are in a, in a position of clear strategy, facing the reality, and with a plan to defeat this virus as rapidly and fully as possible. And I believe that we each have a responsibility as a citizen to look at what we can do. Can we volunteer to help in the contact tracing need? Can we work with our places of employment, safer strategies? Can we volunteer to donate our plasma if we have recovered from the infection? Can we wear a mask out in public as a sign of respect to our neighbors and, and potentially to help lower the rate of spread just a little bit more. I think that we all have a part to play and I believe that working together, we have a much better chance to rapidly squelch the curve, crush the curve if we do it together. Thank you. Thank you. And it's more than we can get into today because we're about at the end of our time. But it sounds like the concept of citizens might have a role here. You're talking about roles that individuals can play. Maybe we'll take that up at another time because there might be roles for people to individually contribute to the research and the crushing of the curve. Glad you mentioned that because it's an exciting opportunity for many people, including, for example, home based uh, 3D printing of face masks that have helped in uh, protection of uh, health workers. So that's your time, but a great subject for advancing science and improving all of our engagement with science. We are at the end of our time now. Uh, a huge thank you to Dr. Feinberg, not only for joining us to the online Commonwealth Club program, but for your myriad of roles that you're playing as a foundation head, as a public health expert, as a physician, as the head of this new National Academies Committee. Thank you. You're, I don't know when you're sleeping, but this is a, a number of roles that you're playing right now. So thank you. We. And thank you for being with us here today. We also want to express our appreciation to all of our viewers joining us online. The club does have a wide range of coming up. Please visit our website for more information. I'm Gloria Duffy, and now this live stream program of the Commonwealth Club is adjourned.